Welcome to Unit 2, Cells Concept 3 Notes for Honors Students. This is about the cell cycle, and then we'll also get into cancer a little bit at the end. So how does this happen? Here's a little context. How do we go from this to this to eventually potentially this? How does that go down? It all begins with a fertilized egg. So once upon a time, a sperm from your biological father fertilized an egg from your biological mother and you became a zygote. And that is the first time that you had all of your genetic information. So half of your DNA was in your biological father's sperm, half in your biological mother's egg. When that fertilization occurred, you became whole and from a genetic standpoint. And that zygote started going through cell division repeatedly. And cell division through mitosis is giving rise to many identical cells. So you became this clump of identical cells. Now, if you look at this diagram, we will learn about meiosis later in the year in Unit 4 Genetics, where we'll learn about how, where that sperm and that egg came from. But we're going to pick up here with that fertilized egg, which is now a zygote, which is going to go through cell division and then a process called differentiation. So that original zygote becomes a clump of identical cells. Those start to differentiate, which is a process of specialization. They be, those cells start to have special structures and functions that give them unique features. And those specialized cells then get organized into tissues, which organize into organs and organ systems, which make up you as an organ system. But originally, so this is the female re reproductive system, fertilization of the sperm and the egg happens in one of the fallopian tubes. And then as that fertilized egg is traveling through the fallopian tube into the uterus to hopefully implant in the um, endometrial lining, cell division is happening. So you can see it up here. One cell becomes two, two becomes a group of four, four becomes eight, and then even you start to see it at 72 hours, so even three days post-fertilization, you're just this clump of identical cells, and then the differentiation starts to happen. So we're going to be talking about how do these identical cells form, and then this process is not only happening here, it's happening right now in your hair cells as they divide so your hair can get longer, and in your skin cells and your blood cells and all of that. But again, you are first just a clump of identical, undifferentiated stem cells. Those stem cells have yet to become differentiated, and they can still specialize into a bunch of different things. So into osteocytes, which will eventually become bone, and cardiac cells, which eventually become part of the heart, and etc. And those stem cells are found in two places. So they are found in embryos, like we were just talking about, um, when your very first cells that have never differentiated while you're developing but they're also found in you right now as a as consider biologically considered an adult. Your bone marrow has stem cells in it, but they're, they're, the difference is they're partially differentiated. So the cells, stem cells that are in your bone marrow, they can't become neurons, they can't become brain cells, but they can become bone and blood and cartilage and fat and other connective tissues. So there are certain cells they can differentiate into. And so what happens is when that blastocyst, so if we go back to that original picture here, that blastocyst will hopefully implant um, into the uterine lining. That's when we, it becomes a gastrula, and it'll ha start to differentiate into first three germ layers. So it'll differentiate into ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. And then those three germ layers will become other things. So the ectoderm starts to become these types of cells, like for your skin and your brain. Your endoderm becomes pancreatic cells and stomach cells. Um, your mesoderm becomes almost everything else. And then this process of organogenesis starts. The process of body organ and organ system formation that follows this gastrulation. So differentiation, we get these three layers, and then those three layers start differentiating more, and then we start forming organs. So here's kind of the levels of what's happening here. We talked about in concept one that the cell is the most basic unit of life that has all the characteristics of life. And we learned about some of the little organelles that make up the cell. And in unit one biology basics, we learned about the four macromolecules, carbs, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids you can't live without. We reviewed some of the atoms that make up those molecules. But none of these things are a life. 
cell is the first level of life here. And then those cells, because of differentiation, will organize into tissues, groups of cells working together for a common function. And then those organize into organs. And those organize into organ systems, which make up you as an organism. So for instance, one of your, so your, some of your stem cells will differentiate and become muscle cells. And then those will organize into different muscle tissues. And then your stomach is an organ made of several types of tissues, but one of those is muscle tissue. And then your stomach is a part of your digestive system, which is a bunch of organs that work together to help your body digest food. And then you're made of a ton of organ systems, like your digestive and your cardiovascular and your skeletal and muscular and nervous system that make up you as an organism. So cell differentiation is an important process. We're not going to get into all of this part in this course, but we're going to stick right here and just talk about, okay, well, how do those cells make other cells? Remember, in cell theory, which we talked about in concept one, all cells come from other cells, and that's because of the cell cycle. Cell cycle is a repeated pattern of growth, DNA duplication, and cell division that occurs in eukaryotic cells. So this applies to plants, animals, protists, fungi. And it has two purposes, growth and repair. You are made of trillions of cells, not just 10 cells that you got once upon a time that have just gotten bigger and bigger as you've gotten older. You're made of all these cells. And then repair is incredibly important too. This process isn't just happening in the womb. It's happening right now. Like I said, as your hair is growing, as your skin cells are um, repairing themselves, as your liver cells repair themselves, that kind of thing. And so we're going to go through this process. It has three main phases, interphase, which is cell growth, um, mitosis, which is the cell division part, and then cytokinesis, which is the actual separation of the cytoplasm at the end of mitosis that gives us the two cells. And as we go through each of these phases, I really, really, really want you to sketch these in your notes. Now, the sketches are going to be simple. Look at this cell. All that we have pictured here are the cell membrane, the nucleus with the DNA in it, centrioles and spindle fibers. And then of course, I guess the empty space is cytoplasm. All the other organelles are there. They're still rough ER and Golgi and ribosomes and all of that, but it would make this picture really complicated if we had all of that in there. So for the sake of simplicity, all of the drawings are just gonna have the organelles that are most essential for understanding the process of cell division, but just know in your mind that the others are there. Okay, so interphase is the growth phase of the cell cycle. You can notice the majority of a cell's life is in interphase. We subdivide interphase into three parts. G1 is the gap one phase. This is when the cell is just growing and making proteins. And then we have the S phase or the synthesis phase. Synthesis means to make. So DNA replication is occurring, occurring here. We are making DNA. We are doubling the amount of DNA in your cell at this time. This is critical. We will learn the steps of DNA replication in Unit 4 Genetics, but for now you just need to understand the importance of doubling the DNA. Your cell is going to divide, and if we didn't double the DNA, when the cell divided, half, each cell resulting cell would only have half the amount of DNA. And remember, the DNA is, your DNA is the instruction manual for making you who you are. So you need the entire instruction manual in all of your body cells. And so this phase is incredibly important. Next is G2, which is gap two phase. More cell growth is happening here and then more proteins are being synthesized to help with the process. At the end of interphase, before we go into mitosis, you should have two entire full sets of chromosomes. So double the amount of DNA that you normally have in your cell. Now, we have to stop and hit some DNA vocabulary. And I know this stuff is tricky, but we gotta learn it now and it's gonna come up in every unit after this. So hopefully I can make it simple for you. I've been using the words DNA and chromosomes somewhat interchangeably, and that's accurate. That's okay in a sense, because your chromosomes are your DNA. Chromosomes are just long continuous threads of DNA that consist of thousands of genes and regulatory information. So think of your DNA as being organized into a bunch of chromosomes. A section of your DNA that has the instructions for making a protein is called a gene. So one chromosome can have a thousand genes on it. It can also have a bunch of space that codes for nothing. We'll talk about that later, but that's what your genes are. Every one of your body cells as a human has all of your DNA organized into 46 chromosomes. 46 chromosomes. Now, this is a different number in different organisms. Fruit flies only have six chromosomes. 
Okay, so the number just, it just varies. Ours as humans is 46. So your brain cells have 46 chromosomes and your skin cells and your blood cells, they all have 46 chromosomes. Now, additionally, in those normal body cells, your chromosomes occur in pairs, which we call homologous chromosomes. Homo, that prefix means same. So sim similar chromosomes. Now, why are the chromosomes similar? Well, once upon a time, when that fertilization occurred of the egg and sperm, half of your chromosomes, so 23, came from your biological mother's egg, and the other half, the other 23, came from your biological father's sperm. And this is why they occur in pairs. Because chromosome 13 from the, your mother's egg is similar to chromosome 13 from your father's egg. There, or excuse me, your father's sperm. They're talking about the same information. They just may be saying different instructions for that information. So those come together and they give the full instruction manual that makes you who you are. I like to think of your DNA as a giant textbook and it's organized into 46 chapters. And chapter one and two are similar but maybe different. Chapters three and four are similar, but may say a couple different things. And we'll get into kind of more of how that affects the traits you inherit later on in units four and five. But I just want you to kind of be introduced to this concept now. So in summary, your DNA is organized into 46 chromosomes and thousands of genes. And they those genes provide the instructions for making proteins which run your body. Now, if you're hoping we were done with DNA vocabulary, I'm sorry to disappoint you. We have a couple more that are really important. So, when your chromosome gets duplicated in the S phase of interphase, we refer to each side as a chromatid, so one half of a duplicated chromosome. When you see an X in, refer, in reference to a chromosome, that's a duplicated one. That would be after the S phase of interphase. Technically, these two identical chromatids are referred to together as sister chromatids. So again, this is two copies of the exact same chromosome. The central region that's kind of condensed is known as the centromere, and that term will come up later. And then the ends of the chromosome or the ends of your DNA are referred to as telomeres, and that will come up in later concepts as well. All right, let's look at this one more way before we move on. So before the S phase of interphase, you have 46 unduplicated chromosomes, or 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes. So let's say this green one came from your biological father and this pink one came from your biological mother. Okay, now, during the S phase of interphase, DNA replication happens and we double these. Notice how they look like X's now. So the two identical copies are called sister chromatids. Two identical copies of the same chromosome, sister chromatids. Together, I would refer to this as a duplicated homologous chromosome pair. Now, I would still say that this is just two chromosomes. I would just say they're duplicated chromosomes, or you have four individual chromatids. I would draw this in your notes and label it. It's really tricky vocabulary, but it's super important that you understand it. And again, because of S phase, because of this, at the end of interphase, we should have two copies of every chromosome, two full sets. So 92 individual copies, if you will that will then divide into the 46 in each cell. All right, let's get into the part that is hopefully familiar from life science and it'll make you feel a little better if you've been a little overwhelmed. Mitosis. This is the division phase of the cell cycle. It's where one parent cell becomes two identical daughter cells. So one becomes two. The general phases are PMAT, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then it ends with cytokinesis which begins at the end of telophase. Now, some people refer to this intermediate step as prometaphase. You can throw that term in there too. It's up to, in my class, we're just gonna learn PMAT. If you're from a different teacher's class, you may include prometaphase. The individual names of the phases doesn't really matter. It's the overall process that really matters that you understand. Because remember, this is a cycle. This is a process. These aren't like individual events. It's a continual thing that's happening. So we're just taking, when we're naming each of these phases, we're just taking a snapshot of a moment occurring within the process. Okay, let's go through each one. Now, like I said, for the drawings to simplify them, I'm only including the organelles that are most essential to the process. So your nucleus, um, your cell membrane, your centrioles with spindle fiber, cytoplasm, and then the chromosomes. Now, a couple things to note. First, 
Notice there are only four duplicated chromosomes in here. If this was a human cell, we should see 46 X's. But because that would be very tedious for you to keep drawing, we're just going to do four. You need to keep up with the number. The number is important. Don't draw four here and then three on the next slide, okay? Draw the four. Now notice they are X's. This is prophase, which has happened after interphase. So S phase has happened. These are duplicated chromosomes. I have two copies of each of these chromosomes. So things that happen during prophase. Your chromosomes condense and they look like these X's. And again, they're sister chromatids because S phase has already happened. The nuclear membrane starts to disappear and dissolve so that the spindle fibers will eventually get to the chromosomes. And then spindle fibers start forming out of those centrioles. Metaphase, think metaphase middle. Your chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell. So spindle fibers connect to the centromeres, that condensed central region, and they pull the sister chromatids to the center of the cell. And they line them up single file because we want to make sure that they're going to split and divide evenly and half go one way and half will go the other during anaphase. Anaphase, think away or apart. Sister chromatids will be separated. They will pull away from each other and become individual chromosomes. And these individual chromatids or, or chromosomes, either is fine here, either term is fine, are going to move to opposite ends of the cell, or some will say poles of the cells. Then we have telophase. Telophase is the exact opposite of prophase. So everything that happened in prophase, we're going to do the opposite now. Chromosomes are going to decondense. So they're going to start to look like chromatin again. Chromatin is thread-like, or I like to think of spaghetti-like, um, instead of these rod-like images. The nuclear membrane is going to reform around the chromosomes at each end of the cell or at each pole of the cell. The spindle fibers are going to break down and dissolve because they're not going to be needed anymore. And then cytokinesis is going to start, or the division of the cytoplasm. In plant cells and animal cells, this happens differently. In plants, there's a cell plate that forms halfway between the two nuclei, and then it gradually will develop into a membrane that splits. In animals, a cleavage furrow kind of happens where the cell membrane will pinch, and then it'll separate into two equal parts. Regardless, the important thing is that the end result is two identical body cells. They both have all of your DNA, and they're the exact same as the original parent cell. So how often is this happening? Well, every cell divides at a different rate based on how often we need it to do what it does. So a couple of examples. The internal lining of your intestines, they're dividing every five days because they're, ex they're exposed to a pretty intense um, in acidity in environment down there of enzymes. So they're going to be or dividing every five days. Your skin cells, they're going to divide every two weeks. This is why potentially someone in your life, a grandparent, a parent or guardian, whatever, has told you you should wash your bed sheets every two weeks at least because your skin, your dead skin cells are falling off even you can't see them. Your red blood cells are every four months. So if you've ever um, had the opportunity to donate blood, you can't do that very often. They won't let you do it unless it's been at least four months since your last donation so that your blood has time to basically regenerate. Your liver cells only divide every year. So that's why liver damage can be really serious because it takes a while for your liver cells to regenerate. They can't just like make new liver cells overnight. And then why do our body cells need to divide again? Why are they doing this? For growth and repair. This is how you grow as a human and this is how things get repaired. Old cells will die out and new cells will replace them. Now, Again, you don't just want to be 10 giant cells. It's better that you're made of trillions of tiny cells for two reasons. One, we really want that high surface area to volume ratio that exists for really tiny cells. This allows us to have the most efficient use of our energy and allows things to move in and out of the cell much more easily, like we saw with in concept two about cell transport. The other reason is think about if a mistake happens. If you're only made of 10 giant cells, if something happens to one of those cells, that means 10% of you is damaged. Whereas if you're made of trillions of cells, if one cell gets damaged, it's not as big of a deal because hopefully your body will catch it and destroy it and it won't be an issue. And that is all part of our regulation process. So how do your cells know when to divide and when not to? Like how do your liver cells know to divide once a year and your blood cells know to divide every four months? 
And then what would happen if this regulation fails? That's what we're going to look into now very briefly. So it's all extremely and highly regulated by a chemical control system that's going to start and stop events throughout the cell cycle. And proteins are playing such an essential role in this. Regulation is both in external and internal. So signals are coming from outside of the cell. Hormones are signaling things. The nutrients in your body are signaling things. But it's also extremely internal. Signals from the cell's own nucleus, its own DNA, are signaling for it and saying, hey, it's time to divide now. One key point in this are checkpoints. These are critical points that stop and go signals regulate the cell cycle. So I like to think of it as red light, green light, that game you play when you're little. Green means go, red means stop. That's what we have here throughout the cell cycle. So we have these different checkpoints. There's a checkpoint during G1 that basically makes sure, okay, are, is there enough nutrients available and growth factors? And is there no DNA damage before we go on and we double the DNA? Um, so those will be things that will be checked. Also, the cell may decide it wants to go into something called G0, which is a resting state. It doesn't want to keep going further through the division process, and that's, that's fine, and that's allowed. Um, during S phase, there's a lot of checkpoints happening we'll learn about during replication to make sure that the replication a process is happening correctly. During G2, we'll check that the cell is big enough to divide and again that its DNA is good and there haven't been any errors in it in the division process or the replication process. And, um, and then in mitosis, there'll be a checkpoint there to check the spindle fibers, make sure they're attaching to chromosomes correctly and things are lining up well. So those are all things um, that will be checked and that will be highly, highly regulated. In general, your cell's in that off or in that stop position, unless there's some sort of stimulus present that's going to signal and say, okay, let's divide. Another key factor in the regulation process is apoptosis. And I mentioned this earlier in concept one when we talked about lysosomes. Apoptosis is a process of programmed cell death. Essentially, an internal or external signal is going to activate genes in the cell that will cause it, those genes will make, produce self-destructive enzymes that will essentially allow the cell to kill itself. Its nucleus will shrink and dissolve and the cell will break apart and then lysosomes will destroy the remaining pieces. And this is critical. This happens during development. So if you look at this picture, you can see when you're in the womb, your fingers and your toes are webbed. But because apoptosis happens, it signals the destruction of those cells, so hopefully your fingers and toes aren't born webbed. But of course, there are going to be mistakes, and sometimes you are born with a little bit of webbing. If you hate pictures of feet, I'm really sorry, and I hope this didn't traumatize you on your screen. But this is an important process. If, you, if your body recognizes that it has a damaged cell, it will try to kill that cell before that cell can replicate, and now you have two damaged cells, or those divide, and now you have four, and then you have eight, and then you have 16, and etc. So it, want, it uses this apoptosis to try to catch and destroy damage in the cell. Now, can that always happen? Not necessarily. And cancer can result. This is uncontrolled cell division. This is when regulation of the cell cycle breaks down and cancer cells are dividing much more often than healthy cells do. So those checkpoints fail or any of the proteins that are are regulating it mess up. There, there can be changes to the DNA in the cell that controls the internal regulation and turn it into a cancer cell that divides uncontrollably. And it can lead to the formation of tumors. These are clumps of cells that divide uncontrollably and there's no room for them, so they start to build up on top of themselves. And tumors can be considered benign or malignant. So benign means those abnormal cells have stayed clustered together and malignant means that some of the cancer cells have broken away and spread to other parts of the body and made more tumors. And that spreading is called metastasizing, or the now would be metastasis. So it's the spreading of disease from one organ to another. Now, benign can be harmless and can be easily removed. My father has had skin cancer, and they've, those tumors have been benign, and they've been able to easily be cut out and removed. But also a benign tumor can exist in the brain. And even though it hasn't spread, it could still cause some great harm there and be 
difficult to remove. So benign doesn't always necessarily mean better or not harmful. It just means contained. Malignant is where they've spread. My mother had breast cancer and it had spread and formed the original breast cancer tissue cells in her breast tissue had spread to other parts of her body. And that's why she had to go through chemotherapy, which affected her whole body. Now, Last thing we're going to talk about, and then we're going to explore cancer a lot more in depth um, through some stations, because I know a lot of you probably have a lot of questions about this. We're just going to touch on a couple of things that can cause cancer. There's so much that goes into this, and we don't have all the answers, and that's why cancer is so prevalent. But these are just some of the things we have seen over time to know that they do cause cancer. One of those things is just biological factors, such as age, inherited genetic mutations, skin type, etc., so for instance, my mom was 55 when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. The older you are, it's much more common to get breast cancer in your 50s or 60s than in your 30s. But you can get it in your 30s, especially if you inherit a genetic uh, mutation like BRCA1. It's, it gives you a genetic predisposition to getting breast cancer. And that's why a lot of younger women who get breast cancer in their 20s or 30s, it's because they have um, the BRCA1 gene. Skin type also. My dad's um, parents immigrated from Ireland, and so he's like a first-generation um, American citizen. He has extremely pale skin as part of his Irish heritage, and that makes him really susceptible um, to skin damage, which resulted in him getting skin cancer. Lifestyle choices can also affect this. Your diet, your physical activity, your exposure to UV radiation, if you're sitting in a tanning bed a lot or you're constantly out in the sun exposing your um, skin to UV radiation, those all play a role. We also know that viruses and other infections can cause cancer. When I was in high school, they discovered that HPV, which is human papillomavirus, can cause cervical cancer, which is an amazing discovery because now there is a, vac a, a series of vaccines you can get to help prevent getting HPV, which can severely reduce your chances of getting cervical cancer. And then also exposure to carcinogens can cause cancer. Carcinogens are just cancer-causing agents. Or another way of saying it is they are chemicals that can cause cancer by mutating your DNA. Examples of this are tobacco smoke, um, asbestos. That's something that is a part of, it used to be a part of um, building materials and older homes can have them. So those are just some examples and we'll learn a lot more in our stations. And I hope this helped you understand the cell cycle and cancer more.